Hello everyone. Thank you PyCon APAC for inviting me to your conference. I'm excited to talk about how we're building a culture of documentation in my current team by learning from Python open source community. My name is Marietta and I live in Vancouver, Canada. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub as Marietta. I currently work as a staff software engineer at Uplight. I've been in tech a long time. I have more than 15 years of work experience working as developer, and I've worked at various kinds of tech companies from small startups to large corporation. At one point, I've worked in the movie in the visually effects industry, so you can actually find my profile on IMDB. I also participate and contribute to open source projects, so I'm one of the Python core developers. If you're not sure what a Python core developer really means, I have a talk that is titled, What is a Python core developer? Um, I gave it at PyCon US a few years ago. You can find it on YouTube. You should also listen to Eric Snow's keynote in this conference, which covers the same topic. The short summary is that it means that if you have a pull request to the Python programming language, I have the special privilege of being able to merge it. So I'm one of the maintainers of one of the most popular programming language. And for my contributions to Python and open source, I've received recognitions such as the Python Software Foundation Community Service Award. I'm also a PSF fellow member. I received Google Open Source Peer Bonus Award twice, and I've been featured on GitHub as one of the maintainers for GitHub Sponsors Program and the README project. So a lot of people are actually surprised when they find out that I do open source in my free time, like I don't get paid for it, yet I am extremely active in the open source community. Why am I doing this? One of the driving factors for me personally is that I'm always learning. I'm continuously learning new things. I learn and experience things that I was not exposed to in a corporate setting. By participating in open source community, I get to hear about the latest technology. I get to learn about the newest features in Python, and I also get to actually use and play with those things. Whereas in a corporate setting, a lot of time you, you work with legacy software. So let's admit it. Unless you're joining a brand new startup, a lot of time you'll be working with legacy software that's outdated. Even when you heard about the new Python 3.10 with pattern matching, you're probably not going to get to use it right away in your workplace. You probably have to go through a certain upgrade process first. And I didn't just gain new technical skills. I found my communication skills improved since I've started participating in open source. Communicating in open, in public, with a lot of strangers is very different with communicating with your teammates in small, closed environment with people you actually know, people you can talk face to face with. So in open source, everything is asynchronous by default. Now in my workplace, even during remote times, I get to sync up with my teammates very often. Whenever we need help with anything, we easily jump on a call. We pair program. We help each other out by pair programming and jumping on calls. In open source community, there is no such thing as jumping on a call. You cannot ask an open source maintainer to come and hop on a call with you to troubleshoot your issues with their library. It's just how working in open in the open source is very different than working in a private organization. In open source, we have to learn a different way to communicate. While it's true that I couldn't ask anyone in the open source community to jump on a Zoom call with me, it does not mean I could not ask for help. It does not mean that I'm, I'm on my own. We get help differently. The way I got help in the open source community is through documentation. Before I got into open source, I did not realize how important documentation is. I, I didn't even really understand what documentation was all about. I've worked in 
six different companies. I've, I have like 15 years of experience. In the first 10 years of my career, we did not do any kind of technical documentation at all. And we didn't do documentation. And I know this is not a unique experience just for me. Even in my current role, one of my responsibilities is actually interviewing potential candidates. Like this year, I get to interview a lot of people. Um, so we interviewed experienced people, experienced engineers who have at least two or three years experience as software engineers. During this interview this year, I would ask about how they do documentation in their workplace. And almost every single one of them, except one person, they said, they don't do documentation. Documentation isn't part of the culture. So what even is documentation and why it's important? So um, maybe you're thinking code comments are documentation or readme file is documentation. Documentation is actually much more than that. If you found yourself asking like, what is a documentation? There's a really good talk that explains it. Um, I really recommend that you watch the talk by Daniele Prasida titled What Nobody Tells You About Documentation. So in his talk, he talked about there are four types of technical documentations. There are tutorials, how-to guides, explanation, and reference. And each of these type of documentation answers to different user need and fulfill different purpose. It is not sufficient to write documentation in the form of code comments. It's not sufficient to write in the form of readme file. You cannot cover all of these four different topic. Now, in the open source world, there are documentation for different kinds of audience. Documentation in open source is what helped me understand what the project, what the library is all about. Documentation is how I learn how to use it. And you're probably already familiar with these documentations as well. These are the documentation available for users of open source project. Whenever I wanted to know how to use something in Python, I could easily find lots of tutorials written about it. I could always find library references. I could learn about them without needing to read the actual source code. In open source projects, usually they would also include a change log, a history of that that's kept, that's kept up to date. So whenever there's a new version of the library that gets released, you could see the change log to figure out what's, what's changed, what are the new features. In Python, we also have PEPs, which is another type of technical documentation. A PEP, which is um, short for PEP, uh, Python Enhancement Proposals. These are documentation that explains how major Python features came to be. So for example, if you wonder why Python have F strings or assignment expressions, or pattern matching, you can read the PEP which documents why those features are necessary, what problems they solve, what were the considerations for the implementation and if there's any drawback. So these are all the types of documentation available in the Python in open source community. Now, these docs, as users, we expect those to exist right? We as users demand that open source maintainers provide this kind of documentation for us. Not only that, there are documentation for the users on how to use the library. There are also documentation for contributors. This is usually called contributing guide. So whenever someone says, I want to be part of the project, I want to be part of the team, I want to start contributing, you'll probably be told, go read our contributing guide. Ask any Python core developers in the world on how you can start contributing to Python. Every single one of us will tell you, 
please go read the dev guide, which is our contributing guide. The dev guide, this guide covers things like how to get the source code, how to set up your local environment, how to run the test suite, what are the project's communication channels and everything. The contributing guide contains all the things you need in order to get onboarded, in order to start contributing and be part of the team. So how about your own private corporate setting? How do you onboard new team members? Do you have, do you have documentation to help new team members get started in their employment? In the first four companies I joined, there was no such documentation. There was no onboarding guide. Not only there was no onboarding guide, there was very little documentation of what features are actually being implemented or have been implemented. There were numerous times in my previous job where there was, there was nothing written down. The only way I would understand how the software works is by testing it, manually testing, run the software and try things out. I have to read the source code in order to understand what, what the product is about. And how did our clients know how to use our software if we didn't have any documentation at all? Um, in my own experience, in the, there were a few clients where the way we would tell them about the product is by on-site visits. We visit them, we give them live demos, and then the clients would be taking notes so they would understand what it does. Our clients take notes. Our clients had to write their own documentation. Now, in my current job, thankfully, we do have some kind of technical documentation. We do have onboarding guide to help new team members. We have written the docs on how to set up local environment, how to run unit tests, um, but our documentation culture is still not perfect. Like we have various docs that are outdated and no longer true. Basically, things have changed, new features got added, there's a change in behavior in various aspects of the software, yet when we implemented those changes, nobody went back and updated the docs. So the docs are incomplete and outdated. The docs are lies because they're, they're not true. There's also this lack of initiative in documenting things. And that's why things get outdated. Like there is a lack of understanding of documentation overall. Some of us just thinks, well, I, I wrote code comments. That's enough documentation. And there is also this, this notion of that, well, we need technical writer to write documentation. I don't know how to write documentation. I'm a programmer. Um, and since we don't actually have technical writer, so there's no documentation. And perhaps we think that, well, you know, everybody knows how this work. There's no need to write things down. Like maybe where there's thinking about, well, this is, this is obvious. Everybody knows how to run unit tests. Everybody knows how to recover the database. We don't need to write down things. We don't need to tell people that. The thing is, people forget. And like, I couldn't even remember what I ate last month, let alone things that happens for years at work. And people leave. So when you rely on this thinking that it's all in our head. We all know this. Therefore, we don't need to write it down. You're going to be in trouble when somebody leaves. And I've, I've experienced this in all the companies I've worked at. Whenever one of our team members leaves for another opportunity, their last two weeks with us will be this brain dump session. So like, We'll have lots of meetings and tell us everything you ever known. But just think about this, like this is not realistic. How do you expect people to share years of knowledge in two weeks time? It's not realistic. And because of this lack of documentation, we then need to spend time and effort to recover lost knowledge. 
And I found this whole thing problematic. Like, not having documentation is a mistake that I've seen again and again in companies. And in the past year in my team, we've been working on improving our documentation culture by applying of what we've seen works in open source community. So as a team, we've recognized how not having documentation has prevented us from being more productive. As a team, we agreed that we need documentation. We're going to invest the effort into having documentation as part of our culture. So we've started to, to demand, to expect, and ask for documentation in pretty much all aspects of our work. So when working on a ticket, we would include documentation as part of completing the work. So it's not enough that we have code changes. It's not enough that we wrote a test for it. We'd ask for the change to be documented. When estimating work, we would ask, okay, there's a code change. What kind of documentation do we need to provide here? Do we need to write a change log? Do we need to write out an instruction on how to set this up? Do we need to write up an explanation on why we implemented this feature this way? We would ask, like, do we have an existing documentation about this part of the code? And do we need to update the corresponding documentation? We would really bring up documentation pretty much all the time. And when, when one of our team members are stuck and needing help, we would still pair program with each other. We'd still jump on a call and help each other out. The difference now is that we would document the outcome. So for example, if I was having trouble with, I needed help with restoring my local database, I didn't know how. Another team member would get on a call with me, they'll walk through the process, and then when we're done, we would write down the procedure of what we just went through. So that the next time, in case somebody else is having the same trouble, instead of another pair programming session, they can now just read the docs. Asking questions in Slack is okay too, that's still encouraged, but Slack messages aren't easily discoverable, it's easily lost. So when we have questions that, are, that were asked and answered in Slack, we would then include this in our documentation and we'd remind each other about documenting things. So instead of simply answering, question in, answering the question in Slack, we would also say, this is the answer. Um, and I realized we didn't, document it, we didn't document this anywhere yet. So can you please add this in our documentation? So we're just really making it clear that documentation is important. It is valued and required. In fact, we consider documentation as part of the job. In our job posting for software engineers, we list documentation as one of the responsibilities. After all, documentation is a form of communication. Being able to communicate clearly and effectively is a skill that we value in team members. It is our job. As developers, we need to care about this. In our own career ladder, in my company at Uplight, we list documentation in communication skills, criteria, in, in order for you to advance to the next level. Documentation is important. If documentation is not yet part of your culture, you should start it now. And there are, there are plenty of resources available for you to learn more about documentation. In the talk by Daniele Procida, he introduces the Diataxis framework, which provides the systematic framework for technical documentation authoring. There is this book that just came out last month, Docs for Developers. This is a really great book. 
I totally recommend that you order a copy, order a copy for your team, make everybody in your team read this. This documentation teaches you how to craft the to craft documentation for each step in the software development life cycle. The Write the Docs community is a global community of people who care about documentation. So they have the Slack community, they have conferences, they have local meetups, they also have guides and learning resources listed on their website for you to learn more about writing technical documentation. Now, I've, I've mentioned earlier on how I came to appreciate documentation due to my involvement in open source. And now I'm bringing in that passion, that culture to improve our internal organization. This practice of using open source best practices into internal organization is called inner sourcing. If your company is not yet engaging with open source community, you really should start doing so. Companies should give their employees time and opportunity to contribute to open source. Don't just use them, give back. And by giving them the opportunity to learn the best practices of open source, they would be able to bring this back to your organization and improve your process. You should practice inner sourcing. So thank you so much for listening to my talk. Thank you again, PyCon APAC, for having me here. If you like to get in touch, you can find me on Twitter as Marietta. And if you rely on Python in your day-to-day -day work, please sponsor Python on GitHub. You can also sponsor me on GitHub, and my sponsors help keep me motivated into doing what I do. Thank you so much. I have only one word to say, Marietta, that is thank you so much. Literally, that was eye-opening. And I'm, I'm, I'm honestly speaking, I have I, I I just remember all the struggles that I had when I was in college, and I wanted to find a perfect project for me, perfect organization for me, and I was struggling. I wasted literally one year. You'll not believe just to find the right project for myself because I it, there was no proper documentation. And trust me just the all that you told i could relate it to it and it was literally an eye opening i think all all the people who are watching would definitely agree with that and it's a topic to be spoken about so thank you so much and it was a wonderful speech and i i do yeah i know like a lot of questions came in for you and i know you would be really happy to answer them as well and the first question I would read out to you, and this is something that I wanted to ask, and thank you so much, Sony, for bringing this question up. <laughs> so the question for you is, do we need to be amazing in programming or writing before we can contribute to open source? Um, no, I think contributing to open source is part of the learning experience. I, I'll be honest. like. I wish I know how to contribute in a little. I, I thought as well, like I need to be great at programming so that I can help other people and write open source projects. But I realized that I get to learn. Even just an example, like I didn't know how to write GitHub bots earlier. Like it is by seeing other GitHub bots available um, by looking at open source library, the GitHub library that Brad Cannon has written that was used to, to write other GitHub bots for CPython. I look at that code base and I thought, I want to learn how to do this. And that's from there, that's how I get to, to become the expert by continuing doing it. Um, so you don't need to be an expert in order to start contributing to open source. Yeah, I think I, I even I would totally agree with that because a lot of people when they when they are so much even interested to do documentation and when they want to try it out, they're like, Oh, my God, I don't know how to code. Can I understand the language? Can I understand what they're trying to tell 
that does that does happen and yes so i hope that answers your question sony i hope it does <laughs> because i'm also fully satisfied so the next question we have is from jin and he asks uh, do you use spinx spinx yes spinx yes yeah. <laughs> I do use Sphinx, uh, C Python project. We use Sphinx. If you go to docs.python.org to read the documentation for Python, if you go to the dev guide, um, the developer's guide to understand how to start contributing to, to Python, those are written and rendered using Sphinx and restructured text. And I actually do have another talk where I cover is um, introduction to Sphinx and documentation, which I give at a, another meetup earlier this year. Um, I, I will find out the link I can share later that introduce you into how to start getting used, uh, starting to use Sphinx. Sphinx itself is it's very popular in the Python community. Actually, um, a lot of other open source projects use Sphinx and use restructured text. Nowadays, things also support Markdown, so I think that that's that's a good option for those who found restructured text to be difficult. But yeah, perfect, perfect, really, really, really good one. Uh, does that answer your uh, question, Jean? I hope it does because she's even ready to share the video. Video is something that helps a lot video link so yes another question just came up uh Mariatha, and i think sony is on the go he has a lot of questions <laughs> so he is like early in your career were you intimidated in writing documentation for open source if yes how did you get over it if no how to be you oh this is <laughs> this is great question and to be honest the first time i wanted to contribute to open source to python um some of you might know that i i get in touch with credo van rosen and one of his early advice was actually he told me you can contribute to documentation like it was encouraged and that's when i in my talk i talk about how documentation effort is valued i see that in open source community we value documentation we demand it we encourage community members to contribute so i i didn't find it intimidating because i felt this is something that was suggested by grido himself and i met a lot of other um, open source community members themselves they they i could see from their reaction like they keep saying yes documentation is important is helpful so don't feel intimidated about writing documentation for open source projects um indeed it is it is useful and another thing to think about is we know we're writing this for other developers for other users they are this they have the same background same they're they're just like you and i like we're not writing for like we're not professional book writers we know that <laughs> like there is there is that we know what to expect so again just don't don't feel intimidated by it and you know if you contribute to documentation the the maintainers will help review it and they'll correct you if needed you know so it's not like they will reject you because you made a typo they'll actually appreciate if you help fix typos so i fix lots of typos <laughs> yes yes wow that's perfect so the kind of people you are with make a lot of difference and they are, they actually guide you that's what you wanted to you wanted to say if you are with a good amount of people and yes your work will make the difference for the next upcoming developers who are getting into the open source communities. And yes, I hope that answers your question, Sony. And yes, we have another question. And that's from Kerr, who's from PyCon Taiwan team. And he is asking something that again, yes, that popped up in my mind too. Could you share some tips to keep up the documentation updated? This is the most important thing. Yeah, this yes. is something that 
that we are trying to do as well in my team. Um, now we come up with this kind of documentation framework, like a culture of documentation in my team, where we would say, okay, in addition to writing code, um, of course, after we write code, we used to think that once we write code, we write unit tests and the job is done, the developer's job is done. But now we will be asking like, okay, we need to write the change log, we need to write the how to if needed, we need to update the, the reference if needed. So those becomes part of completing new feature, completing a bug fix. The next is just really remember, like if you read outdated documentation, if you come across it, go ahead and update it. Like don't need to wait until you're being told to do it or you just open a ticket on an issue saying, hey, this documentation is outdated. This is the new documentation. Somebody need to write it. This is the same workflow we have in the Python community, in the Python, in the C Python, core Python itself. When you write, when you want to create a pull request that make code changes, you fix something, there's a bot that says that expects you to write the what's new entry. Like the bot will scold you if you did not write accompanying documentation for it. Um, so that's just, just something you have to, to start. As I said, like it's a change in culture. You need to impose, you need to start demand documentation from your team. As you change the code, you change the software, you need to be changing the documentation too. Um, just remember that documentation is there, you need to update it. Yeah, that, that sounds pretty good. Yes, I hope that answers your question, Kerr. And if you have any more, you can even connect with her outside the session as well. She'll be there for you. So, okay, a lot of questions more coming up, Mariana, for you. You've got a lot of fans now. <laughs> so, there's a question from Carol, and she is asking how to create a documentation for a new open source project. Wow. That's, that's a great question. And my only answer is that use a template. Um, so, there is this, um, there is this repo called the Good Docs Project, and they have various templates for open source projects that you can use. So I would say if there is some kind of cookie cutter kind of thing that already have a bare a skeleton of what are the different topics of documentation for the open source projects, it has the skeleton of, you know, here's the readme, here's the contributing guide, here's the how to and tutorials in different places. I think we should use that. Or if there's no such template yet, I think one of us, one of you here can start such project. I think it will be very useful. Yes, right. Let's oh, see. one more thing, like, and you don't really need to really, I think it's, it's on top of the using templates. You don't have to invent everything from, you know, just from scratch just look at what other open source project has done like look at python and copy paste their documentation tooling you know like there are just look at other open source projects that you know that have docs and there are lots of them um see what what they're doing and copy <laughs> yes yes absolutely right that cookie cutters you know stuck in my it's stuck in my head so hard <laughs> Cookie cutter, I love that. <laughs> so I hope yeah. that answers your question, Karen. I hope that does. And oh, Gene has one question and he has a lot of add-on to that as well. So he has a connecting question to what he has asked before. He is like, do you use things? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm really bad at pronouncing. It's a tongue twister. I'm sorry again. Do okay. you use things in your day in your day job? I was wondering how easy it is to get unaffiliated teams to use it. Um, this is a tough question. I in my current company and the one before this, I tried 
to make them adopt things um but i got some pushbacks and this is due to usually corporations they have already existing infrastructure for documentation for example they might be using things like confluence which is an atlassian product they might already have documentation somewhere um, in some forms where you can easily edit like there is a web ui where you can start writing documentation you can easily edit without needing to go through you know code review or anything whereas when you, you document using things you need to if you need to make changes to the documentation you need to basically create a pull request and get it deployed so some people were not just were not um did not want that trouble of having to change code in order to update documentation and i think that's the distinctions your team need to decide like maybe there are things like the auto generated reference documentation you may want that to be part of sphinx like to be done by sphinx that can generate or do the the library reference auto documentation and maybe you want other things like onboarding guides to be somewhere else not part of the code um that's up to your team i will not say you must use things in my current team though we do use things also just for technical very technical documentation documentation that lives with the code base so it's more about as i said the the reference documentation um maybe the how to's and the installation are in sphinx we do have the and the way i make people use it is by starting saying we need to use sphinx the other tooling is not good enough um and i i help them set up like i set up the the automation you know um we were already using something like mk docs so it's just a change a little bit of tweak in our ci cd in order to support things so i help the team set set it up and give examples write a brief um, um a brief tutorial to let people know how they can start using things so that's those are some of the ways i i do to to encourage people into adopting things um but again it's i think you have to decide with your team what makes sense for you yeah right right true true that's that's true it's quite lengthy but yes according to what your team requirement is uh, you just want them to look up for the easy way to get get that started right i hope that answer answers your question jean around the sphinx <laughs> so yes there is another question for you marietta as i said the fans are just fans are just flowing in now <laughs> for you so this question is from nell who's from philippines and is an amazing developer nell is asking you is there such thing as too much or too detail in open source documentation i haven't i have seen too little <laughs> like not enough and i i think this is an interesting question um i have seen documentation that is unstructured and that's when it i would find it like this is too much detail um it was uncluttered basically we we have even in our internal documentation we have a really long page that has all the four different types of documentation in it it has the how to's like here's how you can run the unit test and in the same page it also has explanation kind of thing like this is why we do things certain way it this is what i would call too much detail too unstructured however we actually do need 
this kind of information it just it wasn't helpful when it's it's all like all over the place like that and that's when that's why i i mentioned about the the framework the that Daniel and Procida have shared the four types of documentation. I think it's important like you need to to categorize and break apart your documentation that you found to have too much detail. Break them apart into into different into smaller documents basically so that it, it will not feel like this is too much. I feel overwhelmed reading this. So if you come across, if you experience something that you find that there's too much detail, it's it's a hint that you need to restructure and reorganize it. And in the case of it's too little detail, if you as a reader read the doc and you don't find the information you need, then that's also an issue, right? I think in the end, it's all about you as the reader. How do you find this documentation valuable? So, yeah. Well, again, a perfect answer. I hope that answers your question now. I hope it is. Like, it's true. Like, if there is a lot of writing without a introduction, body, and conclusion, just the way speeches are written, it makes no sense. <laughs> true. So yes, that 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 is true. I agree. Any more questions? I okay. I think there's a lot of discussion going on in the general chat, which is really quite interesting. I must say, more than the questions asked. <laughs> I have to read them later. I've been look, like answering questions here. I haven't read the chat, so I, I need to. Do I have it. a question. That's why that's why I pop in. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I have direct access. <laughs> so um so because documentations are mostly written in English and it usually has issues um in countries that English is not the main um the first language. So is I think that causes some kind of barrier when when we are um, I see some Thai developers, it, it took them some time to understand documentation too. So do you think is, there's any way we could actually uh, counter this issue? Thank you for um, asking these questions. I do, I personally feel, I feel relatable. Like English is also not my first language. Um, I think there are actually translation effort uh, for the Python Python documentation. There are groups that are working into translating the docs.python.org into various languages. And I, I'm not able to do any of that, but I think they are doing really important tasks for the community to make the, the language more accessible to everybody in the world so if you found um if you found that english is a barrier and you're not able to understand python documentation i would encourage you to help with translation efforts these are these are volunteer based um but i fully support translation effort into the languages that we all speak um, I, I don't have the link right now, but I think it's the DocSeq mailing list. There is also information in the Python dev guide. In the dev guide, there is a section about all of the translation work groups that are going on. Um, if you are able to contribute by translating, I, I would appreciate your work greatly. I, I do think translation is important yeah i agree i think um i could yesterday when we were doing the dni um work group um, session we did mention about documentation too so pi ladies for example i think lorena came out with the idea um discuss about translating um the process and everyone came out to 
to, to work on the translation for, what do we have, uh, Marietta? We have um, English. Uh, uh, we have the, I know you help with that as well, and thank you. Um, uh, we have the, I think for five ladies, we translated in the, the UN languages, French, um, yeah, yeah. UN Chinese, language. Arabic, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. French, um, Portuguese, Spanish. Portuguese, Spanish, yes. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think uh, for example this kind of um, example it's actually really helpful if um, one country just help to distribute and and share the work that would be that would be amazing to to do that oh uh, Carol did translation from Dev Guide cool yeah there is a link in the Dev Guide for and I think Julian Pollard is one of the coordinator of that. So, yeah. yeah. Let me see. Is there any other questions? No. I think just now, like after this, we have to start new roles coming up. A translator for documentation and get <laughs> new people, new people on board for this role as well. <laughs> Language experts. Yeah, um, I think. If you are, if this is something you can do and you're passionate about, you don't have to wait until the maintainer said, hey, we need translation. Like you can go and say, tell the maintainers, we mm. need this documentation to be translated. I know a group of people who can help, you know, just take the initiative and do it. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Taking initiative is a key, yeah? especially for the community, I guess. Mm. Yes, yes. In the open source, you will find it's all about taking the initiative um, of the things you care about. Mm. Wow. Yeah. I mean, also to sort out documentation is also part of um, volunteering to do the job, especially in the open source. Like what you say in your talk, like nobody's going to tell you what to do. Nobody goes, if, if there's anything or you have to like, find it yourself as it's sorry it yourself it's 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 totally that yeah yeah and i'm being honest like i have seen a lot of my peers and fellow uh, mates who are into this uh, stuff of documentation they actually got job just for doing document uh, documentation on freelance websites or with the other communities so it's almost like a job as well career opportunity if you do documentation Yes. It is a job. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's it great. is. Oh, yeah. A job. <laughs> I I heard a new uh, in, I heard a, a job that I haven't heard before this year. That is a, a one of my friends got a job as information architect, um, and she has like technical writing background. So that's a cool thing. Exactly. Yeah. That's interesting. It, it feels like that's a career I, path. Yeah. That's what I wanted to say. Yes information architect sounds so cool <laughs> <laughs> you might All have right. heard yeah. oh sony said time to get paid yeah <laughs> <laughs> actually payment um it's it's um i think it's it's a very interesting um talk about getting paid especially in the open source community when people said like um i don't get paid why do i have to spend so much time to do it that and and that is a that's a tough one that uh, I I do receive um, volunteers sometimes uh, who wants to help out they will say do I actually get paid for this it's <laughs> it's I, a tough question <laughs> it's it's tough and the it's for me I see it as I don't see myself simply wasting time, like giving time for free, because I get return of investment of my time later. Like mm. all of this, like all the things, all of my contributions, they help me get jobs, like get job interviews. Jeez. Like oh, yeah. it's, it's valuable that you might not realize ahead of time this they this kind of things like it gives me 
opportunity is like speaking here. <laughs> You're inviting me because of my contribution <laughs> to Python, not because I write Python code at work, right? Like th these are the kind of opportunities that I did not realize I could mm -hmm. get, you know? Like, and it's not something that can be valued with three dollars. There are other other values for doing this kind of work. So yeah, I, yeah. It, it is hard, but think about how it can help your career yeah. in the future, you know? True. You get opportunities, you get you build network and network always help with career growth. Like, Absolutely. You know, yeah. I think um, it's it's about transparency. It's about not feeling that what your knowledge is is going to be um, you. The traditional Asian thing, thinking is also like um, I. This is my knowledge. So if you want, you pay me. Then I will give you my knowledge. But I think it's time to change because especially in the open source, it's all about transparency. It's all about yes. sharing because we need to grow. And I think, I, I that's, think that's interesting for me. I see this not just giving time, giving value, but this is opportunity for me to show off to potential employers that I can do this and that. Whereas, honestly, I I work at several private, very private companies. When I early in my career, when I want to interview for a new job, like I have nothing to show. Like all the websites are private. I cannot share a sample source code. Whereas when I start speaking and doing open source, now I have things to show to companies, if they say, no, you're not experienced yourself, I have proof. So this is how it's valuable go. to there me. You go. Yeah. yeah, there you go. I think that's the key. That's the key. You, sh you shouldn't just be afraid to, to share. OK. Yeah. I think I think that's that's about it, because uh, we, we basically cover everything. Um, okay. Yes, we yeah. How yes, can I yes. share my slides and somebody ask about things? I can share my video link later. How how would I? Can, go you can send that? it to us. We can actually uh, attach your slide to this main page. So oh, yes. when people visit at the bottom, they can actually download. Yeah. So if you want to okay. share the slide, we can uh, we can do that. Um, Marika, do you want to do a close up? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. I, I, I just got lost in the way she was explaining everything. To be honest, it was very, very, very good, Maria. I'm literally telling you, it's very hard to find speakers who give you brief but crisp, you know, <laughs> answers to questions. And that's the art of speaking as well, I believe in. <laughs> so, yes, thank you so much, Marietta, once again, for joining us, for giving us something that we 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 least think about like right? documentation is something that we think it's okay it happens someone will do no it's important you made us realize that and thank you so much for answering all the questions and i think even the audience is having their own talk connecting to your explanation <laughs> i can see some amazing stuff coming up in the chat so yes thank you so much once again by the way, um, Marietta, will you be um, available to uh, hang out in the open space? So in case any any people who are interested to ask you questions that they are afraid to uh, ask right now. So if you are available for, for um, some time, you can write yeah. right after this. Maybe you can hop into, uh, what was that room? Open space in the speakers meet and greet area. For five okay, minutes. Yeah. I have I can do I can do right after this. Um I'll take a bathroom break and then I'll hop on there <laughs> after this. <laughs> no problem. Okay, yeah, so if uh, anyone wants to catch up with uh, Marietta, you can just hop into the open space area um, and chat with her in the speakers meet and greet area. Yes, yes. 
Thank yes. you so much. I appreciate it. Yes. Thank you so much once again. And all the people who joined and who asked questions, who I think you had literally an amazing session today. And yes, there are firecrackers cracking up after your speech in my place. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I literally wanted to mute myself, but I have to speak, I understand. <laughs> so yes, they are celebrating your talk. So thank you so much once, <laughs> once again, Marietta. Uh, thank you to all the people who have joined us questions. Yes, as Georgie mentioned, you can just catch, catch, catch up with Marietta in the open space and let's have a talk and you can ask anything else you want. Thank you so much, Marietta, once again, and all, all right. the people who join. And have a great day, everyone. Look up to the other talks that are coming up. Join the Q&A sessions. It's going to be another great day. So thank you so much once again, everyone. And that's from our side. Niharika is an MC signing off for this session now. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye, Marietta.